scripture for you guys. Luke 1, 30 through 33. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Amen. Amen.
Amen, amen. All right, you all may be seated. Good morning. Didn't they do a fantastic job up here? Yes. Uh, we have a few announcements today. Well, first off, you might have noticed some new faces up here today. Um, we have Andy back here. We have Chase, and we have F, so we have Chase, and we have Emily as well. So, weren't they fantastic today? That was wonderful. So, thank you, y'all did great out here. Wow. And so, we do a few announcements. Let me grab my notes. Um, so, walk through Bethlehem has been in full swing. Uh, hasn't it been wonderful so far? <laughs> Now, uh, most of you are probably aware we did have to cancel last night because of the weather. Um, can't plan for everything, but it all worked out pretty well. So far, just Thursday and Friday, we've had over 3,000 people come wow. through here. <laughs> Y'all are excited about that. We've had almost 200 people make decisions at the cross and tomb scene at the end of Walking Bethlehem. <laughs> So for all of you who have served so far, either on the nights of, putting the city together, decorating, baking cookies, cleaning, just everything, thank you. Your service is having an eternal impact for Jesus. And that is such a blessing. So it, it's exciting. So Walk Through Bethlehem has been going great. We are on for tonight. So we are on for tonight. The storm should blow on through by then. Uh, we're going to open up the doors early tonight at 430 so if you know anyone who's planning to come tonight, or if you're inviting anyone out this afternoon, they can come as early as, we're gonna open those doors at 4.30. So they can come on out early. We're hoping, we're expecting kind of a bigger crowd because of yesterday. So feel free to spread that information. And also, if you're serving during the first shift today, you could be here a little earlier. We'd really appreciate that. Um, it'll help us accommodate those guests. And so 4.30 today, Walk Through Bethlehem is starting for our last night of Walk Through Bethlehem this year. So and it's been such a blessing. Um, so, but yes, um, also, in other news, we also have our budgets. If you're going to our annual budget meeting this Wednesday, we have our budgets for you to review at the Welcome Center. Feel free to pick one of those up on your way out if you have not already. Oh, and then um, Christmas Eve, we have our Christmas Eve service coming up. And can you believe this? Christmas Eve is next week. Yes, I know. So it's next week, it's Christmas Eve. So we're going to have candlelight services, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m. That is a Sunday. So, but Christmas Eve, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 5 p.m., all identical services. Come on out. We'd love to see you all here. I had someone ask me before how quick it fills up. I recommend coming early because um, it fills up pretty quick. Um, so, but come on out, three service times. We'd love to see you all here. We also, if you all remember, um, last month we had some new members that joined our church. And we had a couple of people who were not able to be here today, so we're gonna take the opportunity today to present them. And so we have just a couple of people today. Uh, the first one we have is Matt Fogarty. Matt, where are you? There he is. Now, all right, thank you, Matt. And so both of these individuals, just so you know, have gone through our membership process. We have a membership class that we have a, about our church, and we have a series of classes about what our church believes, and they sit down and meet one-on-one -on -one with one of us on staff, and both of these people today have completed this process on top of the other dozen people we presented last month, and so just for different reasons, they couldn't be here, but Matt has been attending since December. He's a member of the Ambassadors for Christ Life Group that meets on Thursdays afternoon. He just loves the preaching, uh, the music, and the friendliness of the people here. He's already been serving in our tech team, um, all these great, you know, the tech team, it's a real funny kind of thing. No one ever notices you if everything goes right. But all of this, you know, all of this sound equipment here, all these, you know, this PowerPoint that goes on here, all of that, there, we have a team of individuals who, they do a fantastic job because rarely notice them, which means they're doing well. And so he's been involved in that. He's been serving in Walker Bethlehem already. Um, we're just so happy. Church, are you excited to have Matt as part of our church today? And then Linda. Hi, there's Linda. So right over here in the front. Linda has been attending our church for three years, and she has been involved in our, um, in our deliverance addictions ministry. 
Um, she's got two grown children, one in Seattle and one in Virginia, so really far apart. Um, so, um, and she worked as a nurse for 50 years. So I know. That's a long time. And so, church, be excited to have Linda as a part of our church family. And then lastly, if it's your first time with us today, and I do know we have a few first-time guests out there. I was talking to them earlier. And so if it's your first time with us, we just want to say thank you for being here. There are a lot of places you could be today, and we are glad that you are here worshiping with us. And so if you have not already, we have a bag for you out at the Welcome Center. We'd love for you to pick that up on your way out. And church, aren't you also excited to have our first-time guests with us? Just, I'm just about done. I'm going to hand it back over to the worship band. But what I, what I would like you to do, if you would, is stand up, turn around, tell either a new member or someone with a first-time guest bag hello, and then we'll get back to praising Jesus.
Today, I've already talked to some people um, that are here this morning for the first time that came to walk through Bethlehem and they decided to come back to church this morning. So much for that. This morning, from Luke chapter 2, is where I'm going to be. So, if you get your Bibles ready to go, if you don't have a Bible, you're always welcome to use one. We have them underneath the seats. You can also use the Bible app on your phone. And, uh, and I know nobody in church uses their phone for like texting or web browsing or gaming during church. Do they? No? no I'm just <laughs> but yeah, please use your phone if you need to. Uh, we would be glad for you to do that, to be able to follow along God's word with us today. I love Christmas. Christmas is almost here. Don't you love Christmas? It is my favorite time of the year. It's a time to celebrate. Some families have different traditions. They, they have family get-togethers, they have singing, they have gift-giving, they go to Christmas parties, whether it's work-related or not, but we have learned from God's Word that the most important part of Christmas is focusing on the Christ of Christmas, the reason for the season, the reason why we have Christmas to begin with, and that is Jesus. Yes. If it wasn't for Him, there would be no Christmas. But even before the first Christmas came, the people in that day, primarily the Jews, they were oppressed. They were oppressed. They were waiting for their deliverer to come and deliver them, their Messiah, their Savior. You know, it was kind of their oppression they faced back then from the Roman Empire was kind of like that boss at work that's always riding your tail and making life miserable for you. <laughs> but it was much worse for the Roman people. Excuse me, for the Jewish people. So they, they wanted God to send that Messiah. They couldn't have been more ready. And the time had come for the Christ to be born. And they knew that God would fulfill his promise. And the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Savior, would be a joy <laughs> to the Jews. But later on, we would find out that the coming of the Messiah, namely Jesus, would be a joy to the world. Amen? Amen. A joy to the world. And the people of Israel, they even knew very specific things about the birth of the Messiah. Particularly, they knew exactly where he would be born. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, God revealed to the Old Testament prophet these words to share with the people. 
He says, but you, Bethlehem of Pathra, although you are small among the tribes of Judah, from you will come forth for me one who will be ruler over all of Israel. His origins are from old, from ancient days. So we learn from that verse that this was going to be someone very special. Someone from ancient days in the past would be the future ruler of all of Israel. And again, we know who that was to be. And we know that he was to be born, according to this verse, in that little town of Bethlehem. Right. Bethlehem. Sometimes Bethlehem is called Bethlehem Judah. Because it was a small town in Judah, in southern Israel, just a short distance from the city of Jerusalem. And the distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem is, and is still very close. It's only about five miles. It's the difference of probably between here and Halifax Hospital. It's that close. Very close. But the two cities were very different. Jerusalem was a renowned city with very prestigious buildings such as the temple, but Bethlehem wasn't so prestigious. But it was also known by this phrase. It was known as the city of David, and David was someone special. David was that little kid with the slingshot and the stone that defeated the giant Goliath, who would later be regarded as one of the greatest kings of all of Israel. And Bethlehem was David's hometown. Bethlehem is where David was anointed by the Old Testament prophet Samuel to be that future king of Israel. Now, how do we tie that into this story in Luke chapter 2? We have two main characters here. We have Mary and we have Joseph. And of course, the most important, baby Jesus. But Mary, who was the virgin, who we know who was to give birth to Jesus, she was engaged to this man named Joseph. And Joseph was a descendant of David's. He was from what we would call the Davidic line. He was from David's genealogy. Now, back then, they didn't have anything like Ancestry.com. <laughs> but they kept pretty good records. The Bible is, a, a, is an excellent record book, among other things. And the Bible gives us that Davidic line so we can follow along and see this very thing. I asked him to put it up on the screen so you can see an example of this. Again, this is from the house or the lineage or the genealogy of David. It's recorded in two different places in your Bible, in Matthew as well as in the Gospel of Luke. But if we follow what Matthew tells us, it starts with David's son Solomon, and then it goes down to Rehoboam, Abijah, Asha, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the rest of these. <laughs> and then we're going to go back up here to Jehoiakim and then work our way down to Zerubbabel. Can you all say Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel. Good job. And then we work our way down through all these other men, and then we finally we reach Joseph. And that is the Joseph that we're talking about in this passage today. And around the time that Mary was due to give birth to her baby, Caesar Augustus, issued a decree that a census be taken. What that meant was this, that every single person living in the Roman world had to go to his own hometown to be counted, to register. And, you know, that census, we still, in our walk through Bethlehem, we give everybody that comes to register, we give them a census card. And somebody last, or we did it on Friday night, somebody made mention of that. I heard him talking to his spouse, and he said, yeah, that card you fill out is called a census card. It's part of the Christmas story. <laughs> so he understood the reason we do the, the census card. But again, it is. It's part of this Christmas story that they had to go and be counted in the town in which they were born. So Joseph, being from the line of David, was required to go to the little town of Bethlehem. <laughs> To register with Mary, his wife. I want you to see this here in Luke chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the entire inhabited world should be taxed. This taxation was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own city to be taxed. So Joseph also departed from the city of Nazareth in Galilee, and he went to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, 
and Judea because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went there to be taxed with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So the Bible tells us the reason why that Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem because of that decree that was issued for everyone that was living in the Roman world back then. So all this took place because of that. But I want you to see this. I want you to see that what they did fulfilled Old Testament prophecy that this baby, as was stated in Micah chapter 5, would, be, would in fact be born in that little town of Bethlehem. So what Caesar Augustus decreed just fulfilled what God had already said, that that baby would be born in that very little town. So in the first century, yes, those Jews, they were to obey the letter of the law. We know that. Along with the Roman Empire, the Jews had the Old Testament, and the Old Testament governed their lives. And of course, in this time period that we live in today, we've been given the doctrine of grace. And that doctrine of grace, you and I get to enjoy today. But in the first century, when Jesus was born, that was not the case. They didn't have the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. The Old Testament included God's law, particularly what was known as the Ten Commandments. And they were to follow the letter of the law. And of course, we know that no one is able to obey all the commandments. And we point that out as people go through, walk through Bethlehem, and then when they finally end up in the cross and tomb scene, they're asked these very penetrating questions, such as, have you ever lied? Have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? Have you ever made anything in your life more important than God? Have you ever disobeyed your parents? And it's funny, a lot of the times, the little kids are the ones that answer no to every question. <laughs> you never disobeyed your parents? Huh? They're lying. But, but we, we ask them those questions because we ask them because we know that we all have. The New Testament reveals to us that the purpose of the law, the purpose of the Ten Commandments was to reveal to us our sinfulness and our need of a Savior. The Bible put it this way in James chapter 2. Jesus' brother wrote, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, if you were to keep all the commandments, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of of all. He's guilty of all. And basically what that verse is saying is if you break just one of God's commandments, you're a commandment breaker. Specifically, if you tell a lie, you're a liar. You're a liar. If you steal something, you're a thief. Simply put, if you sin, you are a sinner. And that's the one thing or one thing that we all have in common. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says these words. The disciple of Jesus, John, said, Hey, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Again, that all ties together to reveal to us that we all have a sin problem that requires a solution. A solution that would provide forgiveness from God whose commandments we've broken. A solution that would mend our broken relationship with God. A solution that would eventually allow a sinner like me to enter into a holy heaven one day when I die. How would that be possible? Well, but with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen? God had a plan, and God gave us the good news through what we call the gospel. In the early days, again, in the Old Testament days, to the Jews, the Ten Commandments revealed sin in their life. They could look at those Ten Commandments, and they could see, just like we can see, where we fall short. But those Ten Commandments, the law, offered no permanent solution to the problem of sin. But that all would change. And that all would change because God sent his sinless son to be born as a baby in Bethlehem. 
but later to die for the sins and the forgiveness of all of mankind. Jesus was that perfect, holy, innocent, sinless sacrifice, the Lamb of God. You see, John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus, his predecessor that paved the way for the Messiah, he was a preacher, and he would preach, and he would baptize people in the Jordan River and tell them, hey, there's one who is coming that is greater than I. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, this is what John the Baptist said. He said, behold, look at the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist told everybody exactly who he was and what he would do. And Jesus did exactly what he said. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes to those that are living today in this age of grace. He says, in whom, speaking of Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, the word redemption is a word maybe we don't use too often anymore, the word redemption or redeem. But essentially, it has the idea of paying a ransom to release a prisoner. You know, two years ago, Kathy and I were leaving to go on a trip. And uh, we were able to fly out of the Daytona Beach Airport. Aren't you thankful when you get to fly out of Daytona instead of driving to Orlando or someplace else? Thank you, Jesus. The flight is actually at the same price or cheaper than Orlando. So we got to the airport. You know the routine when you get to the airport, you drop off your luggage. After you drop off your luggage, you walk up the steps or you take the escalator up one floor and then you gotta go through security. And here I go, I'm the first one. I go through security. No problem, I'm through. And then here comes Kathy behind me. All kinds of sirens, alarms, everything's going off. They make her go back through, back through, back through, back through several times. Oh my. I mean, I was sitting on the other side and I was panicking because I did not know exactly what was going on. And then the next thing I know, they handcuffed her. <laughs> And I'm thinking they're going to take her to prison. And I'm like, what is going on? But thankfully, the arresting officer was one of our life group leaders and member of our church, Mike Rogers. <laughs> so Mike let Kathy off the hook. Now, that whole story was true about everything I told you except the arresting part. We kind of just threw that in. Um, and Mike just happened to be at the perfect place at the perfect time. <laughs> I was like, fight quick. <laughs> i got to get a picture of this. Hey, but all of us are or were prisoners. Prisoners to our own sin. Prisoners who needed to be delivered. As we sang, prisoners that needed to be set free. And sometimes we still do. According to Romans 6, verse 23, the Bible says the penalty of our sin is death. Separation from God from all eternity. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, the prophet of God said it this way. He says, but your sins or your iniquities have separated you from God. And your sins have hid his face from you. And he will not hear. Sin separates us from God. But Jesus, but Jesus, Jesus Christ, the sinless one, took our sin, the Bible says, upon himself. He paid our price. He paid our penalty to deliver us, to save us from the penalty of our sin. You can say that again. <laughs> Amen. He died. We didn't die. He died. He died, and he was separated from God when he was on that cross. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, he said these words among others. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You and I, the separation from God that you and I deserve, he took that separation. Because the Bible says he bore our sins in his body when he hung on that tree. He died for you and me. You see, God is the opposite of sinful. God is holy and God is righteous. 
And Jesus bore our sins in his sinless body. And a holy and righteous God can't mesh with, with sin. It, it's like oil and water. They don't go together. So the Trinity at that point in time was broken for a short time when Jesus was on that cross paying for our sins. But thanks be to God for the sending of his son to this earth. He was born as that babe in Bethlehem, but he was born to die. And that ransom was paid in full. We as prisoners were being released from the penalty of our sin. We're redeemed. We were bought with a price. And that price being the death of Jesus Christ. But thanks be to Jesus that we have the victory. Amen? Amen. We've been set free. Turn to near the end of your Bible to Hebrews chapter 2, the letter to the Hebrews chapter, go ahead and go to chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. Now when the Bible refers to Jesus' blood, we read that verse a little bit earlier from Colossians 1 on the screen, it talks about his blood. We've sang about the blood of Christ. When you see the phrase the blood, it's not the, the liquid, so to speak, that comes out when we cut ourselves. In this case, it refers to the death of Christ. We're redeemed, yes. We are forgiven of our sins, yes, through the blood or through the death of Christ. His death was sufficient. His death was enough. It's not his blood plus something else. Sometimes people say, hey, yeah, you've got to believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you also have to do this. You have to do this religious deed or this religious work. You have to follow, obey all the Ten Commandments or you've got to do. You know, it, it's not anything else in addition to that. Because when we add on to what Christ has done, essentially we're taken away from it. We're saying, Jesus, what you did was not enough. But what Christ did was enough. It was the final complete payment for sins ever offered. In Hebrews chapter 10, look with me at verse 10. The Bible says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And what are the next three words? Once for all. Once for all. It's a done deal. The work has been done. That's why the last three words that Jesus said while he was on the cross were these three words. He said, It is finished. It's finished. It was done. Verse number 12 says this, it says, but this man, Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins, for how long? Forever. He sat down on the right hand of God. And because of what Jesus did for you and I, verse 17 says this. He, then he adds, their sins, because of what Jesus did, their sins, your sins, my sins, and lawless deeds will I, God says, remember no more. Amen. We've been redeemed. We've been forgiven. And what sweet words those are. Redeemed and forgiven. So what's our job based on what Christ has done? We've got the easy job. All we have to do is simply believe. One word, believe. Can you say that with me? Believe. believe. That's all we have to do. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. The moment a sinner believes that what Jesus did on the cross was enough and simply trusts Jesus to save him, the Bible says immediately every sin, every time we've disobeyed God, every time that we've lied, we've stole, we've done this, we've done that, it, those things are completely and totally forgiven. And God now will no longer remember those things. We get a clean slate. <laughs> the word forgiven means this. It means to send away. It means to cancel a debt. And we all had a debt, a sin debt that we could not pay. But Christ paid it for us. Amen? Amen. I love that old hymn. It says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But let me tell you this. This is important. Although once we're saved, we no longer have to worry about the penalty of our sin because we're saved. There are other times after we're saved that we still do sinful things, right? 
And at those times, we can know the truth of God's word that nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in Christ Jesus, so nothing's going to separate us after we're saved. But when those times kick in, when the works of the flesh stir up in, in your life and you start falling victim to temptation and whatever that temptation is in your life, whether it's sexual immorality whether it's hatred, whether it's strife, whether it's envy, whether it's jealousy, whether it's drunkenness, you fill in the blank. What do you do? The Bible says repent. Turn from it. Turn from it. Run away like Joseph from whatever it is. Why? Because you're now saved and the Spirit of God resides in you. And as Paul told the church in Galatia, I tell you, the believers here in the church in Daytona Beach... <laughs> Walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Hey, know this, that if you sin, I shouldn't say if, when you sin, after you're saved, right? Know that your salvation is secure. Your home in heaven is still waiting for you one day. Your penalty has been paid in full by Jesus on the cross. But sitting after salvation still has consequences in this life today. It will affect your life. It will affect your relationship with others. And it will break your fellowship with God. And you don't want any of those things to happen in your life. As Paul told those believers in, in Galatia once again, he said, walk in the spirit. The spirit lives in you. And you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Yes, Back in the Old Testament days and during the time Jesus was born, that Roman oppression that they had, it would have been a blessing for God to send a Messiah to them that would deliver them from the Roman oppression. But there was something that they needed even more than that. They needed to be delivered from their sin. And even today, there exists a much greater problem than physical oppression, and that's the need for spiritual deliverance. For people to be saved from their sin. That law of God that we talked about, those Ten Commandments, they're very helpful to show us how we have sinned against God. But again, that law does not save us. You know, I kind of think of it like a mirror, for instance. Um, a mirror is a great example. I have one here I'm going to pull out for illustration purposes and show you guys. Now, sometimes my wife Kathy, she's here on the front row. And uh, sometimes, you know, Kathy looks at me and she gives me the eye. <laughs> you know, not the eye you're thinking about. She gives me the look, and I'm like, what's up? And she goes, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> and it's usually something to do with my hair being messed up, um, something in between my teeth, a nose hair sticking out, <laughs> or I forgot to wax my unibrow. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't wax my yard around. I don't. But, 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 you know, those are funny things. But what do I do? When she tells me those things, I go to the mirror. mirror. And what does the mirror do? The mirror reveals the problem, right? Hey, I see you guys. <laughs> the mirror reveals the problem. And I see what the problem is. And that's what God's Ten Commandments do for us today. God's Ten Commandments are like this mirror, and they reveal to the person that's looking in the mirror what the problem is. And when we read those Ten Commandments, again, they're an eye-opener to us, and they show us that we're a sinner. And if we're not saved, we're a sinner in need of salvation. They show us a sinner that can't defeat sin. A sinner that can't conquer sin on their own. A sinner that needs someone to do something that we are incapable of doing ourselves. And that's to save us from our sin. And that's why we call it being saved. And we know Jesus Christ is the Savior. Amen. The Jews in that day when Jesus was born, they were looking again for physical deliverance. But God gave them something much greater. He gave them someone to be the savior of the world. 
And to us today, he gives us that same spiritual deliverance. He gives us life, a fulfilling life, a joyful life. And it's Christmas time. So can I say it this way? It's a wonderful life. <laughs> if you're a believer in Jesus, can you testify to that, that being a Christian is a wonderful life? Yes. I can't imagine. It doesn't mean your life is perfect. It doesn't mean everything's going to go right. But being with Christ is far greater than being without Christ. Amen. Being a Christian, believing in what Christ did for you, gives you life. And it didn't come from keeping the Old Testament law. It didn't keep happen because you obeyed the Ten Commandments. The law produces death. But now I have life. I have divine life. And it came from Jesus. And that's why we sing songs like Joy to the World, The Lord Has Come. It's because when you realize that your sins have been forgiven, you have newness of life. It's liberating. It's like a load has been lifted off your back, and it's joyful. And yes, Jesus, 2,000 years later, after this story in Luke 2, he is still making a difference in lives today. I told the first services, and I'll tell you, I just am so moved. I was in tears in the first service in the, during the, the music portion, singing those songs and just reflecting on our church and all the different ways that God has been working in and through you. And the last song that Bill led us in, Because of Christ, you know, talked about not boasting in anything but Him. You know, I was thinking specifically also about our youth ministry, our teenagers in the church. And how God has worked in such an incredible way, even in that ministry, where spiritual growth is abounding in our young people at crossroads and all areas. You look around on Sunday mornings and you see teenagers serving in our kids' ministry, in our nursery. You see them serving in first impressions. You see some of them also serving on Wednesday nights in various capacities. They just formed a new youth worship team. That's all the participants are, are teenagers. It's just incredible to see what God has been doing. And I'm so proud of our teenagers. I'm so proud of our youth leaders. I'm so proud of our youth directors, Angel and Kayla. And I just think about specific things that I've seen over the course of the last few months, and one stood out to me. And it was the gentleman that you saw here on the stage that was standing right here. His name is Andy. It's his first time being up here. And Andy was one of those kids that would come on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights to youth group, but he wouldn't stay for the music or the message from God's Word. He would leave after shooting some hoops. <laughs> but through the love that he was shown from people in our church, God got a hold of his heart. And his life has changed. Not only does he stay now, but he's involved. He's singing one of our lead singers on our praise team on Wednesday nights. Amen. And God is still working today. Now, Andy gave his testimony to the teens um, a few weeks ago, and somebody recorded it on their phone. So this is just raw footage, you know, on somebody's phone. But I want you to get a glimpse of what happens on Wednesday nights and listen to this testimony and the impact that our church and our people had on this one individual for him to come to Jesus. Guys, even though even the ones that I don't know, all of you guys mean a lot to me. And uh, please wear a A beautiful house of God filled with many beautiful sons and daughters of the Most High. People who managed to make me call it home, welcomed me in open arms and made me feel welcome every time I stepped foot on campus. People all looked, to, looked up to us, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, even grandmothers and grandfathers, even the little ones that I have to set an example to. And I'm not gonna lie, I was nervous meeting uh, any one of you guys at first, but you see, I'm, a, I'm actually a very shy person at first, but many of you guys came up to me knowing I was a newcomer and did not hesitate to introduce yourselves. 
I know some of you guys' names, and some I just know the face, and some I've never met, but we'll see each other around sometimes. But I look at all of you guys as family. We all show love for each other, have fun, hang out with each other like the Lord Jesus Christ said we should do. Mm -hmm. And I look at each and every one of you guys, and I see a family. Every Sunday and Wednesday nights, it's a family reunion to me, and every time I come, I am excited to see each and every one of you guys. We are all beloved children of God, and there is nothing safe we can do to take our love away from us, especially for Christ. Knowing that we always wear our arm of God, and I'm grateful, and I really, really appreciate what God has done for me. One of those things are one of those things are attending crossroads with you amazing people. You guys are family to me. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you all for being there for me. Thank you all for the happy memories and may we create more in the future. I love each and every one of you. God bless and may the grace of our Lord be with us. Amen. As we prepare to close this service, uh, that young man there, um, that again now is serving in our youth ministry is going to be leading us in our final closing song today at church. Yes. So as they prepare, would you close your eyes, bow your heads with me, and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for the message today from Luke chapter 2, the story of the birth of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for thinking of us, <laughs> being mindful of us. You didn't have to. You did not have to send your son to this earth to die as the penalty and the payment of our sins. But you did because you love us and you care for us. And you wanted to make a way to restore the relationship between us and you. So, Lord, for that, we're always grateful. We're always thankful. Lord, help us as we leave this place to live the life that you have provided for us to live. A life filled with joy. A life that's filled with love. A life that's filled with Christ. Lord, that's the love that you've showed us that we should show to others. So Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this worship service. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Maybe today you've heard the message of what we call the gospel. You've heard it for the first time. Our prayer is for you to not leave this building today without knowing Jesus as your Savior. If you're here today and you've heard and you've understood, now it's your opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you need to pray and receive Jesus as your Savior, I encourage you to pray this prayer. But more importantly, believe from your heart. God looks on the heart. And you can pray silently these words. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a Savior. And I thank you for dying for me on the cross forgiving me of my sins and make it a home for me in heaven one day. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you're here today and you, for the first time in your life, have prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior, I encourage you. We have two options for you. You can come by and talk to us after the service and we would love to congratulate you, help you in your walk with Christ, give you some resources that will help you with that. Or if you rather... We have cards on the back of the chairs that are double-sided. One says communication card. It has a blue label up top. There's a chance for you to check a box off that you pray to receive Jesus as your Savior. Just drop that in the offering plate on your way out and let us contact you. And again, congratulate you on your decision today. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for being here today. Let's please stand and enjoy singing this last song.
is fit for your use. Would you lead us and guide us? Don't forget to invite somebody out to Christmas Eve, walk to Bethlehem tonight, we'll see you next week.